Shalom Aleichem, everyone. Bruchem Habayim, and welcome this evening. Welcome, everyone, to our first, our inaugural Soulful Fireside Chat. Delighted to have you this evening with us. Hope you're doing well, in good health, Bissiyata Deshmaya. And I'm excited to welcome two very special guests this evening. It's an honor for our Kulal to come together. I hope you're somewhere nice and warm. You have either a cup of tea or something. Uh, right now in Chicago, it's about 14 degrees outside. So it's certainly, it's a great evening to be uh, somewhere cozy with a safer or a book or cooking for Shabbos. But it's an opportunity really for us as a community to once again, re-engage in conversation with some of the important, influential, and inspirational personalities in our community and across the Jewish community. And that's why I'm delighted to begin this series together with someone who I'm lo- I have known for so long. It's hard to believe uh, 20 years now, Liyan Hara, over 20, almost 20 years. Uh, a friend, a mentor, somebody who I can honestly say without whom I would not be here in Chicago, certainly not uh, in this cold in this capacity, the Seattle Deshmaya, and that is to welcome and introduce Rabbi Ari Rakoff. Rabbi Rakoff is now the Executive Vice President of the Religious Zionists of America, of Mizrahi here in the United States, before that holding significant positions both at the Orthodox Union and Yeshiva University. And we go back quite some time and it's a really exciting pleasure and honor to welcome Rabbi Rakoff back to Chicago. Ruchim Avoim, can you see us and hear us? I can. Can you see and hear me? I can't hear you yet, but we can. You can't see. hear me? Can you hear me now? You, you can't hear me? Not yet. Okay. Um, that's not good. Um, One second, let me see. You can't hear? I'm going to come on my. Uh, Sorry. Dialing it up. It's okay. I'm in twice. (laughs) You can't hear me? Okay. One second, it's coming in on the other one. We'll do it old fashioned style. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Now I can't again. Hold on, let me try something else. Let me put this away and see if I can hear you without it. I brought my. uh... Can you hear me? Because I can't hear you yet. I can hear you. Oh, now I hear you. Hi. Welcome back. I brought my, Great to uh, have you. I brought, <laughs> to see you. What's the weather like on Long Island tonight? It's, uh, believe it or not, uh, unusual day, 60 degrees and rainy. Okay. <laughs> but um, I missed Chicago days. Those were frequent, and I, uh, I wish I could be there with you. It looked very cozy there. Yeah, thank God. In the background. It's supposed <laughs> to be a fireside chat, but I didn't turn on the fireplace. We're just going to go uh, without the smoke. <laughs> It's okay. I'm glad to be uh, be able to be with you, and thank you for inviting me. Oh, it's great. It's really an honor. Time. So, so maybe tell everybody, for those who don't know, just a little bit about what Mizrahi in the United States, what Mizrahi in America does. We have religious scientists of Chicago. People are familiar with World Mizrahi, but tell us, maybe share us a little bit, and then we could talk about how you got to where you got. Absolutely. No, with pleasure. So, first of all, really, it's an honor. Thank you, Tracy, for uh, facilitating. And um, I feel like I'm, uh, I'm, I'm right there with you. We spent a lot of time together. So, you know, maybe if it's okay, I, I, I wanted to actually start with, um, you know, you would ask me, you know, how, how did you get involved in Mizrahi? And I realized in thinking about it that actually, um, and I might embarrass you a little bit, Rabbi Brent, but, you know, hey, <laughs> um, you know, this is what, the advantage of Zoom. You know, you can make it up to me later, That's but right. I think your, I think your followers, um, and, and many students will, will appreciate. So um, the, the, my, my, my involvement actually goes back into the early 2000s, exactly as you said, we know each other 20 years. And you know, uh, one fine day, 
you know, a tall, slender, um, you know, bubbly, enthusiastic, Pied Piper is probably the best way to describe it, walked into my office and, you know, we, we started to work on projects. He was from Baltimore. Some might, uh, do people know this? The Baltimore part? You're from Baltimore? They know That's the okay Baltimore part. Fine, but, okay. Rabbi Rocco was being very generous. I asked him, I said, I, I would like some work study opportunities. I'm looking for a mentor. So <laughs> would you take me under your wing, please? Absolutely. And so we, uh, we put you to work on the Torah Tape Library, which little did we know became um, the origin of Y.U. Torah, uh, which is true. And you can tell that story, I'm sure. Uh, and, and perhaps Y.U. Uh, Torah Mitzion Kolel uh, Shurim are housed there, I would imagine. Yes? Okay. Yes, sir. I think so. um, quite a few. So dur- but it was during that period of time that it was, it was uh, those were really tough years. Those were the Intifada years. And it was at that time that, you know, I learned something, I learned a valuable, you know, really extraordinary lesson early on. And I'm glad I learned it then that if you uh, trust, trust people and you, you get out of the way and you let people who know what they're doing do it, um, then things happen. <laughs> and um, within what, two, three months of when we had met, uh, we were on a plane, a charter plane to Israel, um, facilitated by students 20 years ago, by students who are now uh, leader, world leaders, um, who are, you know, R- Rashi Kolal. Um, I, I believe Rav Shanan Geltman was part of that group. Is that possible? Yes, he was. Yes, and he uh, was. Tipo- Tipora was there as well. I'm not yes. sure if they had the same last name yet. And it was, it was really that period because during that period of time, you know, of course, you know, the student activism at, on campus at YU is, is legendary. We actually took the idea from an idea that had been uh, in existence years prior. And Operation Torah Shield was the uh, was the brand. I was the uh, I was the chaperone facilitator, along with uh, Rabbi Reichman, uh, extraordinary people, Rabbi Yamin Levy, and you know, as they say, the rest is history. But actually, what 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 happened is it brought that that uh, opportunity brought us face to face with Rabbi Lamb, with Rabbi Charlap. In fact, I believe to this day, Rabbi Charlap's picture of the three of us stands on his desk. I'm told. Um, and it was really during that period that uh, my own awareness and my own connection to religious Zionism and activism and connection really was born. And while we were, you know, a good 10 years apart, plus or minus, um, and still are, um, it, was, it was during that period, actually, that I was approached by Rabbi Lam um, and Rabbi Blau to join the Mizrahi RZA board. I don't know if you know this, I don't think I knew what a board was, but I have actually been on the board of RZA Mizrahi since then. So that I, 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 I know. <laughs> and it's something that at the time, you know, Sashkacha Pratis, you know, in many ways, and our paths crossed again, of course, um, because a second, you know, really, I would say primary connection to Mizrahi uh, and RZA was through the tournament Sion Kola, where I had the chance to meet Rabbi Matanki, the, le- the legendary Rabbi Matanki, my mentor, teacher, and who I'm very privileged now to work with um, as in his capacity as co-president of RZA. Um, I don't know how he does it all. Um, to, I, I don't, um, every time he takes my call, I think about how many uh, operations and systems and people he's engaging with in uh, the Chicago area. And it, it's really stunning. Uh, but really, as I say, that, that, that was really the, the rest is history, but that, those are really the most profound experiences that brought us together, but also where my own involvement um, became, became more and more um, uh, engaged and connected. So um, at that time, I was the youngest member of the board of RZA Mizrahi. I was the chair of the, uh, of the Young Leadership Committee. But I, I, I want to just say that, that, that my exposure to the Torah Mitzion Kolel, which, which was a privilege to be part of in that it was about 2010, I would guess, right? Does that make sense? Torah Mitzion goes back to early 90s, mid 90s. And the Chicago Kolel was probably we one started of the first. 2008. Yeah. Exactly. We started so when, in so when YU, it was a YU Torah Mitzion merger, of a religious Zionist, you know, um, it was a blockbuster of, uh, of two, no, very dynamic organizations. Probably, I can admit now, I don't know if I knew at the time how, how significant it was, how formative it was, but um, I'm very proud to see, you know, how much you've done and how far you've, uh, how much you've accomplished. It's extraordinary. But that, that is the story. You asked the connection right. to Mizrahi. And in many ways, that, that story is the story of, of, uh, of, the, of the organizations, if you will. I prefer not to refer to it as, as an organization. It's a movement. Uh, organizations do things. 
movements stand for things. Torah Sion is not an organization. Torah Sion is a is a Merkaz Ruchani, uh, the acronym of Mizrahi, um, which many do not know, is Merkaz Ruchani. That's what you have done. That's what you've established, and it's it's an extraordinary thing. I hear I hear feedback about the the call all the time. I know I'm preaching to the choir in this case to the uh, to the uh, orchestra head. Uh, and conductor, but um, I know all those who are listening um, and our, our, our followers, perhaps in Chicago and beyond now in this environment. And, and I'm very, uh, very honored to be here with you to talk about it and to share more about it as well. Amazing. So, you know, that's kind of the, the backstory from your side, from my side, I think about in terms of the Hakaras I told that I have to you for taking me under your wing all those years and, you know, so many experiences and opportunities that I had I'll share this on the screen. I don't know how many people will recognize. Um, that was when I think I was maybe uh, a few pounds lighter, let's just say, maybe 20 or 30. Um, and But you look exactly the same as you did then. All right. I, don't know, <laughs> I don't even know when that picture was taken or where it was taken, but wow. uh, I, I figure uh, you would get a kick out look, of it. Look at you. you yeah. Armed with pictures. If I do that, I would have brought the picture <laughs> too. <laughs> And, uh, so, no, so you amazing. started. So you started back then. At that time, you were working in Max Stern Division of Communal Services right. in Yeshiva University, which was the precursor to the CJF, the Center for Jewish Future. You moved on to work in the OU, working with so many people at NCSY, developing leaders, and now at the Mizrahi. So maybe just to, to tell us a little bit about what Mizrahi does now that we know that you, how you got there. So, so it's interesting, you know. First of all. The, the, the RZC, and I want to acknowledge, you know, Rabbi, Rabbi Dr. Jerry Eisenberg, you know, who, who I, I've really gotten to know more recently, um, but is somebody who, you know, is, is uh, you know, he, he's the Pied Piper of Mizrahi in America and has been keeping the, um, you know, keeping the, uh, the pride, the passion. It's extraordinary. In fact, what's so interesting, and I want to even frame it through the lens of Chicago, the Torah Mitzion Kola, I remember very clearly observing at that period, I don't think I appreciated it, but now I do. Ten years later, the you know the community in Chicago is is very unique, and I'm not just saying that. You know, you'll you won't hear me say that to a community X or Y tomorrow. You know, nowadays you could get exposed on these things, but I, I can say this definitively. So, right. So J Jerry will correct me, or if he's on, he'll put it into the chat. But the history of RZC of World Mizrahi goes early 1900s. Um, um, RZA which was actually called Mizrahi USA at that point, 1913, 14. Again, Jerry will fact check me, but, but Chicago was right there. RZC goes all the way back and has never stopped. It has grown and grown the conventions and gatherings. In fact, I remember the gatherings because there was a, a parallel you know, um, culture between organizations, the Ida Crown Academy, the various shuls. The, and I was amazed by that actually. And in fact, I believe that's contributed to the Kola success because the foundations were so deeply intertwined. That's not a common uh, situation in many other communities. It's sometimes more division, um, which, and then of course there's always 12 tribes, lots of division, but I, I think that the, so, so I don't have to describe it in great detail to all, uh, to all of you who are listening and watching because you know it, you observe it. The, the kolal itself is a manifestation. If I had to point to something and say, what, what is it? You could describe Shabbos, you know, as we know, or you could come to my house for Shabbos and have that experience. Uh, the blend of Awayu and Torah Mitzion Kolel, putting the value, it's a value. It's not just a, uh, it's not a label. We don't do labels. It's a value. You, you, you can measure a value in, in, how, in how we expend our time and how we expend our resources, our budget. That's a blueprint of our priority of what we stand for. So I could describe it and I could tell you uh, a mission statement and I could tell you fancy words in the middle. What we do is what you do. And what you do is a model for what we're going to hope to do in many other places where it's not done. And that's not, that's not anyone's fault. Um, it's just one of those situations where we're going through a renaissance in the world movement, um, which I believe, I hope everyone's aware of. Again, this is not an infomercial um, and because organizations, uh, movements rather, rather do not do infomercials. I don't have an infomercial. I don't really have a picture to show, but, uh, but what we do is what you do. Um, what we do is ensure that the bond and the bridge to Israel is formative. It's in our davening. It's in part of our lives every day. We're on. Uh, we're heading into uh, Sarbateves now, 
it, it, we have moments all the time where Israel and Eretz Israel, which is a foundation of our, of our of, and cornerstone of, of who we are in our identity, is part of who we are. And the challenge, of course, for each of us individually, communally, is how that it gets expressed. So what we do is what you do. I know that might be a simple answer, um, but I don't mean it that way. I mean it very intentionally. That's awesome. So I think one of the things that we need to think about as a community, and you said, Baruch Hashem, Chicago is a place where we have kept this at the forefront of our value system. But every, everybody knows that there are things that are important in the world that need chizuk, like the Gemara says in Brachos. So Eretz Yisrael, uh, it needs chizuk. And our connection to Eretz Yisrael needs chizuk. And so how, how, do we, how do we think about what we can do to nurture and strengthen that connection to Eretz Yisrael in Bifrat. But maybe before we think about the Prat, we could think about, you know, Begadol. Why is it important that we, as one of those 12 tribes that has a specific rooted and spiritual attachment to this Masorah, to people like Rav Kook, Rav Kunterman, Rav Herzog, Rav Benzion Meir Chauzia, like these great going in this Masorah of Torah Eretz Yisrael, of the, the religious Zionist orientation, why is that ideal so important to us? What does it mean? So, so it, it's, it's about, you know, the way we live our lives, you know, and, you know, as religious Zionists, centrists, you know, the labels begin to blur. Um, but the way we, we live, am I on mute? Can you hear? You okay? The way, the way that we the way we live our lives, we 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 religious Zionism is about living in in a real wor world, two feet on the ground. It's about living in a world of grays. Sometimes of it's not binary. It's not black and white. And I think you know, sadly, um, but in a very real way, we're seeing that you know exposed. And that is not on the agenda. You might have other speakers, perhaps, who have a political. Uh, you know, um, you know, platform. I, I do, I do not. Um, and this so, is soulful fireside chats. No politics. Soulful. No <laughs> politics. <laughs> soulful chats above above politics. But, yeah. but 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 the core and the foundation and the values beneath the Gedolim mentioned, and of course, I think it, it has to be um, stated. You know, or Gedai Dov Schwartz, um, Zatzal. Of based in influence, I had read, um, you know, some of the remarks of Ruben that you shared, and Rabbi Matanki, and so many others. And I know there'll be a shloshim soon. Um, but he was he was uh, the head of the Vad Hakavod of the RZA, Zrachi. Um, so I feel the need to mention that as well. But 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 the core values that we live by, it's it is it is challenging. You know, can you be a religious Zionist not living in Israel? Um, how does how does that work? How how do we keep it? part of our lives in our tfilos in a way that we understand it, that we connect to it. And, and I think that, that it's really key to, uh, to go to the, the foundation of it and to sort of see it as a continuum. Values are, is part, it's like a journey. We, we, we cannot um, say this is the binary way. You, you, go, you go to Israel and that's the only way that you can express it. Um, the same way you wouldn't say that about other values. It's a, it's a process, it's a, it's a, it's a it's same way with uh, Libra HaTorah. And, you know, which I know is, of course, the foundation value of the kolal itself. Um, it's a process, it's a journey. And, and I would sort of point to that because I would point to myself in the same way. I went, I was privileged to grow up in the school um, that Rav Soloveitchik founded. Um, I did not appreciate uh, my father dragging me to learn on Sunday mornings when we did not have school to learn Mishnayos with him. But I, did, I do appreciate it now because that meant I had a chance to see with my own two eyes Rav Soloveitchik at a very uh, elderly and uh, advanced stage. Um, I went to organizations and institutions that uh, in Eretz Israel, YU, OU, as we've talked about, who are religious Zionists, of course, in their affiliation, their connection, their mission statement. But uh, I will, I'll speak personally um, in the way of answering your question. Um, the question I, I started to ask myself, sometimes intentionally and sometimes not. I don't know that I asked it um, so, so, uh, so um, skillfully and so, um, and, and so carefully in the early 2000s when we met. You know, we just jumped on a plane and went, and it was it was a destination. It was a place. It was a it's a place that uh, of spirituality and connection. But but if we were to self audit and to really look at our activities, what what are my kochos and how am I connecting to Israel every day, every moment? Is it a do I have an Israel mindset where it's on my mind and I'm thinking about it and I'm listening to the news and I'm opening up a newspaper lahav deal 
And where do you go first? You, you know, you pop into the sports section. Okay, so we just drafted two Israelis into the, uh, if that's your thing, two Israelis into the draft. I didn't even know we had two. I thought we had one. The business section, people have different interests. And I think that's important to be broad in scope, of course, in the Torah realm and everything else. But, but I think that the, the question is a question of how, how do we form that connection individually, communally? And it's really important to recognize that there's a shift in that connection as well. Pre-1967, you know, uh, those, those who remember even earlier, it was existential. <laughs> um, at points when we interacted, it was existential. Time shift, and we have to always shift and evolve and grow and to, and to keep asking that question, but we can't be static in that. You always have to be asking that question. I think that is the underpinning. You know, Rev. Cook did not wear a kippah suga, I don't believe. Uh, the extra now, I don't believe, right? I'm pretty sure not. That's correct. And, That's and right. I also don't, I don't believe that religious Zionism was born in 1903. This is, it's a spiritual, it's a Merkaz Ruchani. It's a way of transporting who we are, wherever we are, which is again, not binary. And that's where we living here, wherever we are, have to connect to that and, and are responsible for taking lead on that. And I, uh, I, that's, I certainly will, will do my best to adopt that mission and put it to practice. So you're talking about two things, right? You're talking about the value system and then the action item of asking ourselves and connecting in practical ways and davening and opening a newspaper in a certain orientation and a certain focus. And yes. so there is the concept there's the value and then there's the action. And I wonder if part that both of those, the action, the action and the ideal, the values, they come from a certain place that we, you know, our community, our collective neshama of our community, so you could say, or the neshamas, the people who, who identify with our masora, is that we have this understanding of, of something beyond the prat, right? We can take care, we can check every box of religious observance of orthodox Jewish living, of connection to HaKadosh Baruch on a prop level, wherever we might be, whether we're in Oceanside or in Skokie or wherever we might be on an individual level. But what, one of the things that Rav Cook is challenging us and inviting us and begging us really and inspiring us to look to is to see ourselves as part of Am Yisrael and what does it mean? And you know, you talked about the question of being existential versus of strength, Baruch Hashem, is that that's also something for us to think about. Maybe we can feel connected in a way when it was an existential threat. The question of what does it mean to be part of Am Yisrael when things are not in an existential threat? What does it mean that we have an Am? You know, have we forgotten that over 2,000 years? And now what does it mean? You talk about a Sarbatebis, the notion of a Churban. Well, what we had then, you know, we didn't have for the last 2,000 years. And now the Rebbe has given us some some sparks of that, some elements, some ratios of tzmichas. So how do we, how do we celebrate that value of the am in an environment that we're not used to? Hundred percent. And I think it's it's uh, you know we take things for granted. It's been an entire year now since most of us, unless unless we have people, uh, friends, and um, you know alumni. Um, up in Israel right now. I, I hope not. I hope they'll watch the recording. But it, but outside of those listeners, not, none of us, I would venture to guess, have been able to go. And if we went, it would be like the old days of taking a boat. Two weeks of quarantine, two weeks back here. Uh, we're, we're not used to that. We, you know, we even commute to Israel back and forth. You know, which flight are you on? Which flight are you on? So um, I think that we, I think we we, um, you know, we can connect to that in terms of not uh, absence makes the heart grow fonder. And I think that certainly is something that I, that I, I think about a lot. You know, it's been an entire year and, you know, your, your, your kid is studying in Israel in one of the yeshiva seminaries used to be. Winter break is coming up in a few weeks. So where are you going? Where are you staying? So um, I think that the, that connection in all ways, you know, from isolation and feeling a little less connected is something that really resonates and just really highlights this value even that much more. So I, I want to say share one more yeah, thing actually, because I, I, I um, you know, identity is formed by ideas and, and familiarity. And I, I would say something not as a, an accusatory way. You know, values are formed in the home. They're formed in experiences. They're formed in many different ways. But I, I do think, and I know the Kola is at the forefront of this. But if I had to point to a, a challenge that I'm that I'm challenging myself with, so. You can listen to me talk to myself this way, but I know so little. I have, I found that I knew uh, my, my 11th grade, now 12th grader was taking an AP in, Jew, in uh, Jewish history. So he was listening to me speak on the phone once 
And he, he knew more facts and more ideas. And I started to realize that I think that, um, and I'm not ashamed to, to share that. I think that, you know, being, uh, be, we have to become knowledgeable. You don't have to finish Shas tomorrow, right? I'm sure the COLA promotes this core value of lifelong learning in every area um, to the point that you can in, in the time you're at with whatever background you bring. And I think that our, we have to all look in the mirror. You know, if this is our identity, if this is what we stand for, if this is important, so what do we know? Um, what, are, what, what are the schools that we're in uh, teaching in this realm? And the answer is not enough. I don't want to say nothing. And, I, and it's not clear that it's all taught in the class. I don't believe that either. But it's something that I, uh, it's certainly on my mind. It's something that I think is very much at the core of any ideology and identity formation is how, how, how much are we learning? And I share that because I know the Kolal's core value is this and you're modeling it. And I want to salute you for that because sometimes we take those things for granted, uh, but it's not. Um, I think it's something that um, that's key. So would you give a one now? I, I'm, I, I could task you with uh, teaching, but, but yes, I think your teaching should be spread further. Um, the Kolal has that capacity and I hope that's an opportunity for us to uh, connect again. So it's certainly something that has been meaningful to me. You know, you saw where I came from intellectually, spiritually, coming here to be with Chavre Akolo, who were, who are, who uh, over the years have come from Israel from different yeshivas. It's totally changed my spiritual makeup because my exposure to them and their Torah Saritz Yisrael, and they're introducing me to so many ideas of Rav Cook, even having learned for several years in a Hesri yeshiva, over year, the years, like you said, it's a lifetime of learning. So making sure it's one of our challenges as a COLO to make sure that we can continue to bring that to the community in a year in Corona when we don't have uh, Israeli Chavriya COLO. So we're continuing oh, to I didn't think know about that. that. I didn't yeah, know that. because we couldn't bring anybody due to the visa restrictions this year. So it's our first wow. year without. So we actually are partnering with Torah Mitzion to create virtual programs. So we have some different Torah that are coming on video. We had a sheer um, not too long ago, we had a guest here. Now we're having one from Rav Rimon coming up before uh, Tu B'Shvat. So yes, trying sir. to make sure that we keep those, those educational opportunities because we have to nurture this value, this vision of this Torah and this Masorah. It's, it's like we said at the beginning, it's something that needs chizuk. Like everything, like Torah and Talmud Torah and davening, the Gemara says, but Eretz Yisrael, the Gemara says, Baruch, these are things that need chizuk. So our connection certainly needs, needs chizuk. And that's one thing that we're we're going to be focused on going forward. It's certainly something that I've benefited from by being in this environment. And we're happy to share that. And thanks to technology, it's something that we can. Any, any yeah, closing, uh, concluding thoughts that you want to share with everybody that, uh, that they, they should really remember and take away as they think about, everybody's thinking about you know, this conversation and their own relationship to Israel and to Eretz Israel and the Klal and the Am. Any final thoughts that you think are important for people to keep thinking about? So I think, you know, I don't, I, at the risk of repeating myself, I certainly, that's not my intention. I, I believe that, um, you know, we, I'll share one thought, you know, one thing that I thought I found very um, surprising, um, surprising at first, um, but as time has, you know, evolved and my involvement in world Mizrahi, has um, has got has got, has obviously evolved it with it as well. I was I was pretty stunned at how, at the vibrancy, the contrast of vibrancy in other communities. Um, I you know I know another another experience we shared was in Australia under the leadership the good the able leadership of uh, Rabbi Rabbi Dr. Avery Joel, among many others. You know leading communities around the world. You know the community the Mizrahi is the community <laughs> the, the the shul the school the vibrancy. We're in 20 Absolutely. countries, which I, which, I, which I have zero credit for. Uh, Rav Doron Perez and the dynamic team around the world and um, is, is not just inspiring, it, it, it's, it's spurred by, by things we take for granted, anti-Semitism in, in Europe. It's rampant. We read about it. Do we connect to it? We have a certain, I would say, I say the word complacency, not... Um, but, but even though I, I mean it that way, but not in a way um, that's, that's, um, that's uh, in, from a negative as much as I think we take for granted certain things. And, and that I think the situation in the world at large, we're all in this together, um, certainly I think uh, um, inspires that. But I see this not just as a responsibility of connecting to Eretz Israel, but also all around the world. The communities are looking to us. 
I never thought about it. Uruguay, Chile, Argentina, I've been to some, I haven't been to others. They're looking, they're taking notes at the models of what we do, the ideas of what we do, how we do it. There's more Jews in Chicago than the whole United Kingdom. I don't know if everyone's aware of that. I didn't Process know that. that. There's more Jews in Chicago than the United Kingdom. There's more Jews in Toronto than the United Kingdom. There's more Jews in Philadelphia than the United Kingdom. There's more sh members in my shul in Young Israel of West Hempstead than the entire city of Boston, which is where I'm from, uh, uh, with the OFC and connecting us. Um, but that, that's a, it's not the numbers are the most important, but it's pretty telling. And I think sometimes we, it's not so much complacency as much as, oh, that's the way it is. We have this restaurant, Romanian, which one are we going to? Ken's Diner. I used to fly back and forth to Chicago when we started the cola. I used to get orders from all the Chicago, uh, David Saltzman, Rabbi David Saltzman, my next door neighbor, I used to get orders in. But in other words, we, um, that's important. You, know, you have to have the right thing to eat. But uh, no, but I, I, that's something that, that surprised me. I'm inspired by it. We we have calls uh, every other week around the world from Australia. They're up at twelve o'clock at night. We're up at five six in the morning. So but but there but lives. it's it, it's uh it, the Am Israel is even broader with Eretz Israel as our focus, and it's something that um, I think the world we should be teaching the the Chicago Tournament on Kolo, you know should should you know reach out and facilitate conversation not just in the greater chicago area but beyond especially in this platform that's the silver lining and so eretz israel is in our focus but our responsibility call israel or even zela is that is everywhere and they and they, they're looking at our models they're copying our model right now in terms of Kola, on the white terms of Kola. so they're watching it and now they can view it too in other words that's they right. may not have been to chicago but they're watching it right. and that's something that I, I just didn't appreciate even though I'm not sure how it would have come to it, but I see it now. And let me tell you something, they're watching and many of the other communities are more advanced than, than we are. And I'm taking notes as well. Um, so yeah. if I had to share something, I would share that. Uh, let's not take for granted the, the enriched and extraordinary um, you know, Jewish lives that we live. Um, let's take responsibility for that. Um, and you know, I, I, uh, I'm, I thank you for inviting me. You know, to be thank part you of for, it's really an honor. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being here. It's so beautiful. Personally, of course, obviously, every time I have the opportunity to see you, it's amazing. Uh, but also to be able to raise this in our consciousness for our community and in general to making sure, making sure that this, to make sure that this continues to be part of our identity at the forefront. So thank you so much for the time. Great to see you. Regards. To thank Deborah. you. Thank you. Regards as well. All right. Have thank a great night. Thank you for night. inviting me. Bye. Great to have you. Take care. Ah, Rabbi Rakoff special chaver and our, our special guest tonight, another chaver of mine. Can you see me and hear me? I think, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Uh, great. Ruchem Aboem, wonderful to see you. Rabbi Yechiel Kalish, uh, I, I think we could still call you a Chicago and I'm hope <laughs> as someone who is, I guess, a Tzikin Akimeter to Chicago, a Tzikin Akimeter in some respects, but I could still say that I have the opportunity to be in the same community, at least at this, for these five minutes, with Rabbi Yechiel Kalish. And, you know, we, we're we thinking tonight, we're getting together with people in the community to have fireside chats, to have conversations that are soulful, that are ruchnias. And to do that in the, in the lens tonight, really about thinking about Am Yisrael. And for those who do not know, uh, Yechiel Kalish has been a, I would say, a trailblazer in, in Europe, maybe they would call it uh, as a Stadlon or Askanos in advocacy, in representing and advocating for the Jewish people, for Kalal Yisrael, for individual Jews here in Chicagoland, the state of Illinois, across the United States and in the world. And so thinking about what it means to be a Ben Torah, a Ben Aliyah, someone who's connected to the Rabbon Shalom and living in this, in this world, to have you share a few thoughts with us tonight and share some of your very busy time. It's wonderful to have you. I don't know you. Uh, if I should share what your next step is or if you want to share that or if it's still a secret. Oh, I, someone, I, I someone think told it's me, pretty out there. <laughs> it's pretty out there. You know, so, as someone said, you know, a secret is something you tell only one Jew at a time. That's, that's <laughs> the definition of a secret. So soon to be at the forefront of Hatzala which is a credible opportunity that uh, we wish you tremendous hatzlacha in. Thank you. So I don't know if you're headed back to Farak away uh, sooner or later, but uh, we're going to certainly miss having you here. But maybe, maybe you could just open up and share with us a little bit about 
as someone who is a Ben Ali, who's been a Ben Torah your entire life, you know, grew up here in Chicago, learned, and has come back to the community and been a part of so many different areas of Askanas. How do you see your, your neshama expressed in the work that you do, whether it was in the state house, some of you um, who are watching, I would hope most of you already know, you serve with distinction as a state representative of ours, but also in your general uh, advocacy. How have you seen that develop? It's, it's a great question. Uh, I don't know if I've, I've thought about it in, the, in that lens. Um, you know, I had, I had uh, as, a, as, an, uh, as a member of the legislature, which is very different than being an advocate or an Askin, right? A Stadlin, as you said. When you're a Stadlin, when you're an Askin, when you're an advocate, so you have a very clear mission, right? You have a very clear mission uh, as directed to you by the Gdele Taira or, um, you know, uh, by individual board members, et cetera, whatever it is that you're doing, it's a very clear mission. So, you know, your soul, your neshama can come out in your uh, interactions with others, right? Uh, that, uh, you know, when you walk away from them and, you know, they say to another individual, you know, that really touched me or, you know, the way he said something really, um, uh, you know, inspired me, right? So, you know, we always look for those words um, because you want to be an Orla Amim. You want to be an Orla Goyla. Uh, there's something that's supposed to be different about individuals who spend, you know, 12 to 15 years in a yeshiva setting, right? I mean, that, sh that should have some <laughs> impact on our ability to interact with others in, in a different type of way. Um, but as a legislator um, and as uh, somebody who um, represents 108,000 people, many of whom are, are not Jewish, so your, your mission is uh, much more complicated um, and uh, it, it becomes a lot more challenging. Uh, I was the most identifiable Jew Right, uh, you know, uh, I always used to joke, you know, like it's pretty obvious, right? Uh, uh, in the legislature, first rabbi, <laughs> first rabbi, first yeah, right? first Muslim, possibly in the country, we're still we're still debating over 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 somebody. Uh, so uh, we're going to give it to him first, you know. So I'll be the second, uh, but the first one in Illinois. So anytime a Jewish issue would come up. You know, it was a Jewish holiday, Purim or Yom HaShoah or Yom HaZikaron, anything that was going on, uh, you know, I was chosen to make the speech on the House floor. Um, and that's where I think, you know, some of my neshama came out. Uh, and, uh, you know, when I started crying, reading the story of Izzy Stark, um, you know, uh, as he was being brought to the camps uh, on the House floor, that, that I, it took me by surprise, the emotion that I felt. So yeah, there's, there's definitely neshama that comes out. <laughs> Amazing. So you mentioned before that you've had the opportunity to interact with some great ga'onim, sadikim, gadolim, whose Torah insight has informed how you've gone about interacting with various political leaders, you know, and... Um, we exchanged a little bit before about the number of Minsker, Minsker, yet another Chicagoan, we're gonna yes. shout out to all of us <laughs> Chicagoans. You know, he had a tremendous outsized influence in many ways, in many realms, and his passing this year is material left the big void. Maybe you could share a little bit about your personal interactions, because I know you had a very special Kesher with the Nova Minsker. Yeah, I, I used to, you know, there was a, there was a few years back, the Nova Minsker Rebbe spoke at a, an, at a Laguna dinner, and one of the honorees came, called me the, the day after. It was upset with some of the things that the Novominsky Rebbe said. In other words, some of the topics that he had chosen to speak about at the dinner that night. And he said, you know, I have I had family there and, you know, this is what he chose to speak about. So, I, you know, I listened, you know, as a rabbi, you know that you have to do a lot of listening, right? Um, so, you know, I, I, I listened. Uh, and then I, I shared with him, I said, you know, for a period of time, I had this was to drive the Rebbe around, okay? Um, from mundane uh, doctor's appointments to, you know, important meetings with other G'daylim, 
uh, to back and forth to yeshiva for a little bit of time. So th- those were ve- those were unbelievable opportunities. Um, I saw the Rebbe uh, during the Tkufa in every possible situation, ev- every possible human uh, interaction that you could possibly want to see another person. I witnessed the Rebbe. I witnessed him opening his mail. I witnessed him eating breakfast. I witnessed him going to the doctor. I witnessed him, you know, every possible. I witnessed him getting angry. I witnessed him getting happy. Every possible interaction, and in every interaction, he was a guddle. He was a guddle at all times. It, it, it was, it, sometimes I, I would say he was even a malach. You know, in certain situations, how he just controlled himself and had complete. He had complete and total control at all times. And I said, you know, I'm in the car and I'm and I'm with the Rebbe and he is getting calls from all the G'daylam in the world, not just in America. And many times I hear him, you know, giving advice or talking something out. So I said to this person, I said, you know, the Rebbe, I would guess, is involved with 50 to 75 percent of every major Shiloh that's in that's going on in Klal Yisrael at this time. If he chose to talk about those topics, <laughs> it's probably because that's what's happening. <laughs> and you know, he, that's who he was. He was he was he was he was so practical. Uh, he was he was very special. You know, during my last personal interaction with him um, was, was, you know, we, we had some, some very serious shyness that we were going through in the legislature. And um, I had suggested a, an approach to dealing with a situation that could be personally harmful to me, but um, could be good for the community. And, uh, and the Rebbe started crying I started crying. He said, uh, what about the nasham of my yichil? And he used those words, my yichil. You know, like, what about the nasham of my, my yichil? Like, there were other people in the room. The whole place was bawling. You know, you want to know about a man who has a neshama. You want to know a man who, who, who saw, you know, the, the, inside the soul of another human being. You know, that, that was not Rebbe. He was just... And how did he... So how did he transcend or balance, you know, the big ideas and the practicality? Because you were dealing with the Lamaisa, like the votes yeah. and the individual. So how do you see him? How did he help? Well, he was ultimately bridge that. He was a Pisic. He was he was very very much a Pisic, um, you know. But at the same time, he was he was a Manhig, and he had Shimush. His father his father was a Rebbe. Um, he was he was very close. Uh, to Rav Palm, he was he was close to Gedolim uh, from from a previous generation. He was very close to rebellious Sve, um, even though they they disagreed in approaches to uh, to different issues. So yeah, so he he had um, both the ability to look at the big picture and really dial it down, like really dial it down. If you read his farm, is you know Emma Sliakov, you know uh, uh, you know he 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 has you know in his the, his breadth of knowledge was was unbelievable, but you see him, you know, break down a sugya down to its core, and that's that's how he dealt with every aspect of life, you know, uh, and, and he had that ability to really to hone in and 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 help you, you know, really, for the individuals who had these chus to be close to him, he helped us, you know. Rav Aram Chaim Zechariah Levach, the Rashi that tells Rashiva Zechariah Levach here in Chicago. He didn't make a decision without calling the Rebbe. You know, he called on every big communal decision. He just called the Rebbe to talk it out, um, and it was, you know, he was he had he had a, he had a huge impact on this community. Um, many people probably didn't even realize it. Wow. So one of the things that you have the great schus of in your various roles is Chesed. You know, sometimes it's professional Chesed, sometimes it's an avocation of Chesed. You know, when you were in New York, and then. Here and you know, how, how can you uh, share with people a little bit about how how Chesed has shaped your life or the Chesed that you see in the community that the Tzibur is doing? Because you have witnessed some extraordinary Chesedim. Uh, Kali Yisrael is awesome. 
no, Klal Yisrael is awesome. You know, there was a, um, uh, there was a, uh, I don't remember what it was. It was, it was. it was years back, I don't know, 10, 11 years, years ago. Um, it was a Rabbanim meeting that I had attended. And um, it was depressing. Whatever it was that we were <laughs> discussing <laughs> was depressing. And um, I decided I was going to slam my fist on the table and scream, Klal Yisrael is awesome. <laughs> and I started sharing at this Rabbana meeting uh, what it was. And I was, an, I was a, a staff member. I wasn't a smicha, yeah, but I was not one of the Rabbanim. Uh, and um, and I, I just started sharing all the different um, amazing things that that, that Klal Yisrael does. I mean, look, Chicago is a great example. A any type of need that someone is having, there is an organization of some sort dedicated to meeting that need, right? You know, in, in terms of, you know, the Chicago Center for Turn Chesa, the, you know, the different Kailal and your Kailal, you know, the, all the different shoals and everything that's going on in, 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 in the shoals, uh, the way people care about each other. I mean, look what's going on during the Corona, how people are helping each other with Parnassa and, 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 and dropping off packages for food. And I mean, it's just like, it, it just doesn't end. And, you know, we win as and Hatzala, obviously, I'm very proud of Hatzala, and it's really it's really an amazing organization. But you know, as somebody who is involved in the broader world as well, you know, in a leadership position in the broader world, I will tell you that nothing like what we have exists. Nothing, right? The the large charitable organizations that that we'll see in, you know, uh, in the press as making an impact, so to speak. I mean, that's, that's a Shabbos, uh, you know, appeal in one of our shoals, right? I mean, it just that doesn't even, they don't even come close to the giving numbers or the, you know, there's a, a food pantry in the district somewhere. I don't want to mention it, but they were very proud of this food pantry. And they wanted to show me the food pantry and, you know, and the number of people that they served. And I'm expecting, and they're building this up and I'm expecting this big food pantry. So I go to the food pantry and I'm just like, whoa, right? This is, this is not as large as I thought it was gonna be. It wasn't the ARC or the Chesed Fund. No, so I decided, right? Maybe it was a little foolish. I decided I'm going to invite the heads of that food pantry to see both of the other ones, right? That you just mentioned, right? To see the ARC and see the Chest Fund. They were <laughs> blown away because you could put you could put six or seven of theirs into you know the two uh, that I that I described, and both of those food pantries, both the ARC and the Chicago Chest Fund, service anyone who comes, uh, which is very special. So um, the chesed in our community, Kali Yisrael is awesome. I mean, look at Shasharit, look at, look at, look at, look at the, all the different types of organizations that exist within Kali Yisrael. It's just very, very special. So yeah, it's beautiful. we're lucky. But I, oh. I, will tell you, I will tell you from a, from, since you're, you know, this is a Kailal event and you're a Rosh Kailal. So, uh, so. But I'm, but I'm wearing a sweater, so. I'm wearing, we, we could be, sweater. I'm wearing a sweater sitting in the living room. So it's a different suit. <laughs> So, Rav Aaron Cutler is famous for saying that that the Chesed um, will be the downfall of Tyra, right? His, his, that Chesed will be the downfall of Tyra, and you know what what Rav Aaron meant is that in their time, as these Chesed organizations were growing, and Klal Yisrael has, I mean, we're, we're the Bnei Avram, right? So Chesed is is just such a strong part of our DNA. Um, people were throwing money at chesed organizations, but Tyra couldn't grow, right? They couldn't raise money for a kailal. They couldn't raise money for a yeshiva. So, you know, we, we would always, you know, try to encourage people that, you know, um, the Tyra is, is, is the primacy. Where, where do we get this innate nature to give so much? It definitely comes from the Tyra. So, you know, whoever's watching, make sure you give the money to the kailal. And, <laughs> and, <just, laughs> and that's all. Matzal the fashas. And that's all. 
Yes. It's beautiful. Yes. So maybe we'll switch gears for the last couple of minutes that we have and really focus on, on a core Mida, which I think, especially in our community and especially in our time, is a unique challenge. And that's the Mida of Bitachon. Because in our community, we emphasize the role of Ishtadlos, the importance of pursuing a Parnasa, pursuing education, pursuing the scientific solutions to whether it's COVID or other health issues, or all kinds of things. So we are, we're focused on being Mishtadel. And yet we have the responsibility and an opportunity and that connection to be tough on. So how, how do we create a space for Hishtadlus and create a space for Bitachon? How do we make sure that we're having the appropriate Hishtadlus and appropriate Bitachon? You know, you were out there for so many years and you're continuing to be Mishtadil and yet you have Bitachon. So how do we, whether it's related to a person's individual parnasa, whether it's related to the coronavirus that we're struggling with, whether it's the, you know, the global issues that you're advocating for and dealing with, what are some perspectives that we need to think about when we come back to ourselves and say, hey, yeah, we've done a lot of Ishtadlos, but, but where's Bitachon? Where does that fit in? So, so I'll tell you two, two, two mahalchim that I received from, from uh, Gedalim on this, uh, on the Shiloh. Um, I went to see Rav Michal Yudalefowitz, the of the Bracha, who was one of the, one of the Rosh Yeshiva in, uh, in Panovich. So I think this was in 2006 that I went to, because he passed away in 2008. So I had to, so I think it was 2006, I went to see Rav Michal Yudalefowitz. And I said to Rav Michal Yehuda, I said, uh, I've been in, uh, in the Aguda now, I don't know, I think it was there four or five years. We've had tremendous yata, tremendous hatzlacha. Um, I said, let me go back to Kailo. I said, because I'm, I see very clearly that we would create a plan for a certain project. The plan would go completely awry, but we would be successful anyway. So obviously it has nothing to do with me. I said, it's, it's just so clear that it's not me. So it's it's clearly a Kaddish Baruch Hu. So let it be. That's, that's when you were in National Aguda. That's when I was in National Aguda. Yes. Right. For I, those I who made don't know, exactly. Right. For those who don't right. know, Rabbi Kalish was both in the Aguda here in Illinois and then uh, in Midwest and then National. Yeah. Correct. I was so, making. Yeah. yeah, I was making. I just made the transition. So, um, so he <laughs> he got all upset. Uh, he got he got all like agitated. He was like, like ready to jump out of his uh, out of his seat. Uh, and he went and he and he grabbed the he grabbed the chumash, and uh, he didn't grab the chumash. His his grandson, who has since become a good friend of mine, uh, Ruven Karlinsky, uh, grabbed the uh, grabbed the chumash and uh, gave it to gave it to the Zeta, gave it to uh, to the Roshiva. and he said to me the following board. It says that um, that uh, by by Brius uh, by Brius and by creation. It says in the in the second paragraph of the is ve'ed yalem in aretz ve'adam ayin labay to sadama, right? And and Rashi says right that adam ayin labay to sadama. What does it mean? Uh, and and it's, sorry, it hadn't rained yet because adam ayin adam ayin labay to sadama because there was no man to 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 work the field. So and Rashi says ve'ain makir b'tayvasan shal gashamim, right? Right, that's Rashi. Rashi being Makavitavos and Shalgasham. He says, Your job isn't to do, your job is to tell the story. He says, You think your job is to do? He says, You're the only one that can see the Yad Hashem and what's happening. Whatever it is that a person is able to witness Yad Hashem, it's their responsibility to tell that story. Hashem has chosen you to tell this story. So he says, it's not for somebody else. He says, you're the one who has to tell the story. He says, you have to do it. So that was one mahala. So, you know, and so I, I, I okay, all right. <laughs> so that, that's my role. And Baruch Hashem, I've been telling stories. Uh, and we have crazy stories to tell. And the Rashiva Zechrein of the Baruch Hashem, Rav Aram Chaim used to say the following. And this is just so important as it relates to Bitochan. It's so important as it relates to Ishtadlis. 
the Rashiva would say, Pshat in Hishtadlus, is that you are working so hard and you put everything into it that when you look back, you say only Hashem could have made that happen. He, he said, that's Pshat Nishtablus. Pshat Nishtablus is working so hard and so intently that when you look back, only a Kodesh Baruch Hu could have given me the Kayach, only a Kodesh Baruch Hu could have made that happen. That's beautiful. I never heard that idea. Fascinating. Yeah. yeah. So uh, so that's that, that's what drives me, and I know it drives a lot of uh, a lot of his Talmidim, uh, because there are some dark times. <laughs> there are some. Yeah. <laughs> dark times. You know, you need a you know, you just over those Because I think I think that that helps us because you know we want to pursue that Hishtadlus, but we also need to nurture that bitachum, right? This whole, you know, the pandemic that we're in, it's sometimes very confusing because you know we we want to we want to pursue all the scientific avenues. We're going to observe all of the, the regulations. And for those who are watching, we still need to wear masks, even if the vaccine is coming, right? Like not those pieces. Not right, not over Zoom. <laughs> not no over one's the... in my living room right now. I don't know I'm here alone. In the office. <laughs> right. um, but, but, the, but the ability to say, you know, there's the base for Bitachon. You know, how to make sure that that becomes part of the conversation. Yeah. You know, that, you know, that, that the davening is part of the hishtadlus as well. I don't know. Did you ever uh, did you ever get caught davening when you were down in Springfield? How did that How did that oh, work yeah. out? Just what, oh yeah, that didn't close with that. It, it's both positive and negative. Uh, you know, um, I got uh, this is a mincha. Mincha's you know it's usually not it's usually not a problem with Meyer or Shafers. It's, it's 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 usually mincha, <laughs> and. Um, I'm on the floor, and so, and, and the, the floor is Kilu. Uh, uh, you're in a Hasna hall. There's no windows. There's no. You don't know what the, what time it is, you know. And uh, the pumping oxygen in the in the room, so like so you so you don't fall asleep, and because uh, we could be going for hours at a time. So um, I look at my watch, and I, I'm like, I'm close to Rabbi Tom, right? And I, <laughs> and, and I and I and I am Minfa. So, um, so I had to go to the back, uh, I, I, on the floor, I couldn't go off the floor. So I went to the back of the floor and I started dominating. So of course, you know, there were votes going on and I just, I couldn't move. Uh, and, um, so the parliamentarian got very upset. Uh, he was just like, like, what, <laughs> what is going on here? Like, well, this is not a shtibol. What are you right? doing over there? <laughs> He couldn't fathom what I was doing, why I wasn't answering anybody, because uh, there was nowhere to hide, right? And uh, but there was this 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 woman, uh, a staffer, uh, a lifer. You know, she's she's got to be 50, 55, 60, Been been in Springfield, working at the Capitol forever. Um, and she said to the parliamentarian, "He's praying." And you better hope he's praying for all of us. Fine, <laughs> <laughs> gesagt. So, exactly, exactly. She was great. She was great. And every time I saw her, say, "Are you praying for me, Rabbi?" I say, "Yes, I'm praying." For <laughs> That's awesome. So, uh, but yeah, the, the 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 few minutes when the parliamentarian was not happy it was not exciting. <laughs> I love it. Oh, yeah. It's great. So, Wonderful to see you. Bimat Sliach. HaKadosh Baruch Hu should continue to give you the Koach and the Siat of Yishmaya to enable all of us to live, to thrive, to grow through all of your work on behalf of Kuala Yisrael, on behalf of the Jews of Chicago, on behalf now, please, God of Hatzala. And uh, hopefully we'll continue to see you in person on a somewhat regular basis. Thank you for taking the time and just continuing to inspire all of us. So great Anytime. to see you. Thank you for inviting so, me, really. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Great to catch up. Thank Absolutely. you so much for coming. Good. Good evening. Thank you for coming. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. It's been, uh, hopefully, an enriching and inspiring evening for everyone who has had the opportunity to be here, who will be watching this. And please, God, we're going to continue joining together, coming together, let's say, about every other Thursday night over the coming weeks. So stay warm and stay well.